Hello chess friends from the Remote Chess Academy. This is International Master Valero Liwop and today I'm going to talk about a very interesting topic that I believe each and every one of you is very interested to hear and that is the topic of uh, actually exploiting imbalances. See a lot of times people don't know how to think or how to handle this so I will try to provide my best in terms of explaining how exactly does that work and what you have to keep in mind whenever it comes down to you um, you know having to think about weakness or vulnerabilities that you'd like to exploit so we start with the game that was played in Zurich 2014 between Magnus Carlsen to my mind the best player who would you know about who, who manages to get it and exploit the opponent's weaknesses perfectly today and his opponent was the, the very talented Fabiano Carana who was actually playing with the black pieces so basically after the moves of e4 e5 knight of three knight c6 white played the Spanish the uh, real Lopez as it goes with the bishop to the b5 black chose to do the move of um, Knight of six, and then White played d3. Now, a lot of people do consider that the d5 very, the d3 variation is rather passive, and and indeed there is a point about that. But uh, you have to know that d3 is actually quite a decent idea. The, the the most important value about this move is that it stabilizes the center, and it promises a rather quiet, gradual game that is going to be developed within the next moves. So. After that move, okay, black actually plays d3, uh, bishop c5, and bishop takes the c6. This is an interesting choice. White is willingly choosing to give away the bishop pair just so that he could possibly attack against the black center. And it is a very good idea to do because then we can follow up with uh, plenty of nice developing moves um, that will come out. So after the move of bishop takes the c6, black played uh, d takes the c6, usually that's the major line in this variation, opening up the bishop's road and uh, ultimately mm, you know, coming up with ideas of bishop g4 or whatever it is. So that's quite, um, quite a decent move. After the move of uh, d takes the c, he actually chose to play, we, cho we chose to play h3. Now, take a look at this uh, very interesting move that uh, Carlson just did. This is a move that helps you to see how a weakness is supposed to be exploited. It is not about attacking or destroying or threatening so much as it is about gradually limiting your opponent by taking away the valuable squares that you would like to keep and then you know, actually developing towards that by making sure your pieces get a little bit more advanced and a little bit more powerful and so on and so forth. And so you could see why the move of pawn up to h3 now actually is so very good. It is a quiet move indeed, but it takes away black's ability to play with the move of bishop to the g4 and things are looking better now. Slowly. Remember, if your opponent doesn't have any immediate counterplay or something great to do, you have no business rushing up the position. On the contrary. So the first thing about exploiting imbalances is actually to think about a way to go slow and try to think of a, you know, like just a chance to build up the position to the point where we can actually exploit the opponent's weakness. So h3 was a pretty good move in that aspect. After this, black played um, knight d7 defending the pawn, which made good sense. Okay, so he played this. And then after the move of knight to the d7, uh, this was a good point where white did a move of bishop e3. I'd say a pretty strong looking move. The idea being is that in case black actually exchanges it, we can do f takes to the e, thereby increasing the power toward in the center. And uh, yes, after bishop e3, bishop d6, white plays knight c3. It's interesting to see how simple white is setting up the position. It is rarely ever about complications. It's co the more you complicate it, the harder it gets. 
So usually it is about that simplicity that helps you out to achieve a more consistent position. And so white actually does it fairly well here. With knight of the c3, things look good. Now, uh, after that was actually played, black chose to do the move of um, c5, short castles, knight f8. So how would you play right now? Maybe you want to actually pause this lecture and then think a little bit about your own thoughts, um, you know, as to how would you think about doing, you know, advancing. Would you think about attacking or would you actually like to pressurize uh, in some way? What's the right way to go? It's a great, it's a great question, really. Very interesting. You see, the first thing that matters a lot about these positions is to make sure that you build. Now, building up the blocks of power, as I call them, usually resources the two ideas. The first idea being the, the plan to maneuver the pieces around so that they can get more advanced or more capable positions. And the second very valuable idea is to gain space, usually by opening up lines or taking some more advanced positions, you name it. But it's very important that you do this because that's exactly what would help you to take the advantage. It takes time to get this happen, but it's important. So what is the right way to go for it? Actually, in that specific position, then White plays the move of Knight of the D2. And that was a great move. Knight D2 is related to the idea of playing um, quickly with the move of Knight of the C4. And what's so interesting about this is that now it's not just the fact that we can do a move of... Uh, Knight c4, but we can also see the possibility of playing uh, quite quickly with pawn up to the f4, and so it's just it's a really good idea. Step by step, White is really going to build up and get the chance to exploit it. You get the chance to exploit it. By the way, this is a very interesting thing to, to understand. It's not about exploiting it immediately. It's about getting the chance to do it, which is very different. So. First thing, maneuver the pieces. Secondly, get the space, get the proper control that will help you even more. So after that was played, after knight of the d2, now of course, here, then black chose to continue with knight g6, knight c4, and bishop d6. So that was nice. I mean, actually, obviously, black was just uh, ar arranging, or we could actually consider rearranging the species pieces. So after the knight g6, white plays knight e2. And what do we see here? Well, <clears throat> we see a couple of things, but most importantly, we realize that there is the move of f4 that white could uh, advance with. It's a powerful thing. If it happens, the first thing that we'll realize is that there will be a huge amount of space that white will control, but it's not just about that. It is about everything else. It's about exchanging, taking, and so on, which is good. And so knight e2. Take the time. The, bu the building blocks of your attack all will, will always or almost always require quite a few of these extra moves, so to speak, to uh, you know gather up the pieces you need so you could advance. But they're necessary. And so when Black played Queen D7, White exchanged, and then he moved with F4. Trade takes, takes, takes. Now take a look. It's interesting that white fixed the black pawns. Now, to some, this will be a crazy idea. We just fixed his weaknesses. How could this be good? How could this be any good? Well, we did it because we knew that that is going to help to transform. You remember, there is no chance or possibility to use one advantage all the time. You know, if you have a weakness, for example, oftentimes you may not be able to exploit that weakness, especially if it's a pawn. Especially if it's like not that close to your pieces. But what you could do is to exploit his side effects. Like the fact that he doesn't have that much control. The fact that he's actually a little behind and, and, and passive or backward. And so that's exactly what white is doing right now. While black was definitely quite passive, <clears throat> white uses a couple of exchanges. Not so much in order to exploit the weakness um, you know, of the, uh, the double pawn. But on the contrary, try to think about a way to go in the king's side. And it was a great idea because now f4 definitely opens it up. 
And now after rook takes to f4, a new imbalance is created as in the presence of the opponent's, of the opposite colored bishop in the opponent's little space. White gets a great space. Now white sacrificed the one advantage of the double pawns to get two more that are, in my opinion, even bigger. So this is really interesting. So after black cho chose to do b6, the question is what is the point of this move? Maybe black would like to do d5 or something like this, but it really didn't matter because now the moment black played it, uh, white can continue here with the move of queen h5. So he keeps on building. It's interesting. We do not exploit the opponent's weakness immediately. It takes a lot of time, you know, to really gather up and get all those forces around so that they can, they can get ready and attack. But what is great about it is that now we have the queen and the rook. <clears throat> we have the pressure against f7 and possibly the black king. And everything looks excellent. Black played d5. Not a great move, I'd say, I have to admit. But then, what should white do? Black is, you know, desperately trying to get some counterplay. He's desperately trying to open up the center, really get give his pieces the more uh, shots to, you know, attack anything, really. So what is white's best way to go about this? This is a very important question. Well, you could see it's actually about the move d4. Nobody has the right to open up the center that quick. If they do, then usually that causes a lot of weaknesses. And that is exactly what you get to exploit. The tr trouble is that presently right now, with the move of pawn to uh, d4, in case black exchanges, then there's going to be the recapture with the bishop. There's going to be all these attacks tactics and whatever you call it one of the biggest ideas is that you've got to open you do not open things are really not going to work so let's do it and after d4 black played c4 b3 it's interesting that every single move more or less creates or puts black under a very severe pressure we're not relying on nice, quiet moves to make this happen. We're relying on the possibility to just constantly make him to worry again and again and again and again, which is very unbearable. A lot of times, the opponent's just not going to be able to hold it. And that's what happens, more or less, actually. Here, so let's see. <clears throat> After the move of pawn to the b3... Then black played with queen to the c6. Not a great move, but I guess he just had to do it. And then after the move, queen to the b, queen to the c6. White played rook f1. And now you realize the whole value of all this. Just let's get the pieces going. They're close, and there are, uh, you know, there's perfect pressure out there against the opponent on f7. Long side castles. B takes to the c. Queen takes the C. So white has built almost everything. And yet it turns out that we get this position in which eh, it feels like white's got something. But it's hard to prove it. It's hard to really, uh, you know, I'd say capitalize on it despite the good looks. So really the question is, okay, white has a good game. He's already built the position that he wanted. So how does he actually bring that together? What does What do we do? Do we uh, choose to pressurize? Do we attack in some way? What do we do? So I'd like you to think, what would you do? We got great position for attack. We have the center. We have the pieces. We have all the necessary squares that I love. All of this is wonderful. But what to do to make it count? You know, that was actually quite interesting because... There is not, or there doesn't seem to be an easy way to do this. No easy way to do this. But, there is a way to do this, anyway. And the way to do this was actually through the move of Rook Dix F7. And that was awesome. What this move is doing, actually, is that it breaks through th a sac with a sacrifice. Now, a lot of people will be like, ah, I don't want to sacrifice, this looks too risky. What if I don't calculate it too well? 
it's never about calculation. Now, you have to understand something. When it comes down to uh, what I would call often as a committal move, a move that's so committal, you know, like you're sacrificing something or breaking through, uh, it's really not about calculation. It is about evaluating the consequences, and more specifically, two key things that will help you to see if there is a natural progression to that sacrifice, or it's just one of these, like, you know, 50-50 type of combinations. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So what is the way to do it? Well, the real way to do it is to ask yourself, what is the follow-up, or what do I win from this. If you win something great because of that, it's perfect. You do it and you go about that and you go your way. It's great. But if you don't, then <clears throat> you have to keep analyzing or maybe that actually provides you with a good possibility to know, okay, I'm not right. I don't want to, I don't, I shouldn't do that type of move. After rook takes f7, bishop takes f7, rook takes f7, the good thing is that white's so the follow-up. There is a lot of things that white could do in this position, including the possibility to make moves like queen to the g4 and uh, include the bishop and everything else. It is a wonderful resource that practically breaks in the black territory and provides white with great attacking opportunities, like rook takes d7, king takes d7, and e takes d. Also, what additionally helps a lot in these positions is what I would call the uh, minimum. What is a minimum? A minimum means like you have figured out, if in the worst case scenario, even if you forget something or you miss to see a possibility or whatever it is, what is the worst that can happen? Now, in that particular case, white is an exchange down, but he's got enough material. So even if things go astray, we still have enough to uh, continue and actually not feel bad about this position. That is how it's about uh, how how it's supposed to be done. It's a really good idea, and we do it, you know, because of that. So uh, I think it's a really interesting thing to look for the minimum because that gives you more of a realistic idea on what you can expect in the given position, not just to say, oh yeah, well, let's sacrifice. I hope it it goes well. It's not about that. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look and see what happened. After e to the d, black played with g6, queen g4, king c7, and now white continues with queen e6. To me, that is a powerful move. Really great add there. So just we have this queen. As we get that queen out there, uh, you know, inside the black position, we see that um, the opponent is going to have uh, a problem with his king. Then we can have uh, the, a candidate move of uh, bishop f4 coming out quickly. Actually, this is perfect in the moment so black does not get a chance to play the queen takes the c due to queen to e5 he has to do king b7 check there queen e4 queen d7 check on the d6 bishop f4 and king h2 and now we're going to talk about the biggest concept of all you see people don't actually realize it but in many occasions, what you might find interesting is that it is all about pressure. It is rarely about, you know, the possibility for you to win something or get a great idea, a great tactic. It usually does not work like that. But what is the key is keeping the pressure. Now, what does that mean exactly? Keeping pressure means that you hold your opponent down on the back side for as long as you can. If you do that, oftentimes you will be very successful, and that's what you would like to consider. So in that type of position, uh, after king h2, even if black gets a little bit of time to make something, it doesn't matter, because truth is, he is not going to get a chance to stabilize or do anything great. And so like after that move is played, uh, the position is fairly bad. He played rook c4, white plays bishop g Pressure means keeping your opponent backward. And there are many ways to do this. Just force him to stay back on the defense. And it's it's great. Now, obviously, Black's got many problems with that pawn on the d6. He's awful. So he played with rook c8, queen d3, king b7. But then white just continues going and going and a4. And you see that the black rook really means nothing. Why? 
because it's supposed to do something. The truth is that now the black rook cannot really go anywhere. And as you could see, it's not just that. It's also the fact that, uh, you know, if the rook can go anywhere, if the rest of the pieces are so bad, just white could keeps going. Rook e8, a5, here, and c5. You see white just keeps providing more space and more opportunities for his pieces more and more and more and more until basically black cannot hold it no more. That was great. So, of course, a couple of next moves are clearly just about a tactical sequence. White's queen is coming along and uh, he's able to win. Pretty effective check. If he takes, we take and then white's a bishop up. It's amazing. What I love about this game is really how white utilized the power of making sure that he could gradually build the position by regrouping his pieces, taking more space, and more importantly, transforming the advantage when there is an opportunity to create more pressure and there's a good follow-up. That these are the three most important factors for a successful attack.